Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us stand to receive His Excellency Antonio Mascarejas Mantiero and his wife Maria Mantiero, please. You may be seated. Uh, before we uh, start our uh, program this evening, uh, there are a uh, couple of things that I'd like to do. Uh, the first of which uh, is that, uh, to punctuate the obvious, today is September the 11th. Uh, it is the uh, sixth year since the attack on the World Trade Center. And I believe it would be appropriate if we might pause for a moment of silence uh, in remembrance of our fellow citizens who died on that day of infamy. Amen. During the course of our time together uh, this evening, there will be a few folks that I'll recognize from time to time. Uh, there are a number of our colleagues who are here uh, this evening. Uh, Dr. James Pritchett, who is uh, a professor of anthropology, uh, and also uh, I am very pleased and proud to say, a member of the advisory board of APARC. Jim, would you please stand? Uh, <laughs> likewise, I'd like to recognize a, a colleague and dear friend, uh, the Honorable Walter Carrington, uh, who served our country with great distinction as the U.S. Ambassador to uh, Nigeria, among his other postings. Walter. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, old Africa hand, uh, a professor emeritus uh, from one of those schools across the river on the other side, uh, but uh, someone who has uh, not only labored in the ivory towers, giving uh, intellectual content uh, to our understanding of the ebb and flow of developments on the continent, but someone who was willing to roll up his sleeves and get his hands dirty to affect change, Dr. Willard Johnson. Willard. <laughs> on behalf of the African Presidential Archives and Research Center uh, at Boston University, I'd like to welcome all of you here this evening for the inaugural lecture of our fifth Bell for African President uh, in Residence. Uh, this is the signature program of the archives. And uh, so it is with great care and deliberation uh, that we determine uh, who we might appoint. And uh, this year's uh, president in residence will certainly not disappoint. Uh, here this evening to bring greetings on behalf of the university is our provost, Dr. David K. Campbell. Uh, David was named provost of Boston University in September 2005. He had served as provost ad interim uh, beginning in July uh, 2004, and Dean of the Boston University College of Engineering uh, beginning in two September 2000. Uh, Dr. Campbell came to Boston University from the University of Illinois, where he served as professor and head of the Department of Physics, a theoretical physicist who specializes in nonlinear phenomena and condensed matter physics. He holds degrees from Harvard and Cambridge universities 
and spent nearly 20 years at Los Alamos National Laboratory, including eight years as director of its Center for Nonlinear Studies. Uh, it is a pleasure to introduce someone who has been a friend and supporter of uh, the Center, uh, our provost, David. Thank you, Charles. With that introduction, you might expect me to give the speech tonight. Um, it reminds me of a story I, ca I cannot now resist telling of our former president, uh, John Silber, who was once introduced in an event like this by uh, my predecessor as engineering dean, uh, Charles DeLisi. And Charles went on as, uh, Charles DeLisi went on as Ambassador Stith has gone on with a very ornate introduction. And John got up, John Silber got up and said in one word, just remember, I pay his salary. <laughs> Anyway, on a more serious note, uh, good evening. Uh, as Charles said, I am David Campbell, the University Provost. And on behalf of President Brown and all of us in the senior administration, it's my pleasure to host and welcome His Excellency, President Antonio Mascareñas Montiero, and his wife, Mrs. Maria Antonina Montiero, to Boston University. I would like to commend the African Presidential Archives and Ambassador Charles Stith for organizing and sponsoring this lecture, APARC, as we call this successful center, provides a forum for African leaders to share their insights on current and future policy deliberations in Africa through various international roundtable discussions and interdisciplinary classroom venues. This evening highlights this interdisciplinary approach and the international presence of Boston University by providing an opportunity for us all to benefit from the highly regarded experience and expertise of His Excellency, President Montiero. And I know from discussions beforehand when we discuss some of his peacekeeping roles in uh, Africa since he stepped down as president, that you're in for a wonderful and very interesting lecture. So thank you very much. Before I uh, introduce President Montiero, I do want to take a, a moment for uh, a special intervention. Uh, the African Presidential Archives uh, has now gained some renown for our ability to convene leaders from both the public and private sectors uh, within the United States and beyond our borders to focus on issues of urgency and importance uh, to the African continent. But I often uh, make a point of punctuating that uh, it's not just the politics of Africa that is our interest, but the history of Africa that is our interest. And so for us, developing archival content is very, very important. Um, as Many of you know I teach in the International Relations uh, Department. I'm on the faculty. I teach a course on Africa and globalization, obstacles and opportunities uh, being the formal title. Last fall, uh, as I began to take the role during my first session of class, I noted that there was a student who seemed just a tad older than everybody else seated in the room. Uh, that person was Bob Ward. He joined the class under the Boston University Evergreen Program, which allows anyone over the age of 58 to audit graduate and undergraduate courses for a modest fee. Uh, as I became acquainted with Bob, I discovered that he had extensive experience with Africa over the long term. He was a graduate of John Hopkins, receiving an MA in 1957, when there were but three independent sub-Saharan African countries. He had a long and distinguished career on the continent in the financial services sector, working first for the Bank of Monrovia, a subsidiary of Citibank, uh, then consulting for Arthur D. Little, 
and then to the Bank of Boston and Bay Bank. And I might add that while he was at Bank, Boston, Bank of Boston, uh, we got to know each other uh, in an interesting and intimate way around the issue of apartheid in South Africa. And as you can imagine, we were sitting on different sides of the table then. Uh, but uh, after uh, leaving the, uh, the banking sector, he's one of those folks who gives retirement a bad name. He became the executive director of the Massachusetts Office for International Trade and Investment under the Romney administration. That office having the responsibility of attracting foreign investment to Massachusetts. Bob and his wife have lived uh, in a number of countries in Africa, Liberia, Nigeria, and the Cameroon, and Bob has visited more than 40 of the 54 countries on the continent. And as you can imagine, given the work that he did and the time that he spent on the continent, he amassed quite a collection of documents, papers, reports, artifacts, and objects of art. Well, uh, after his term in our course, he decided to do something very special. That being to make a contribution of his collection to the African Presidential Archives and Research Center. That collection uh, contains close to 300 items of studies, plans, loan agreements, and policies which are unpublished. Uh, and in addition, uh, 42 African relics and statues and over 200 books that were published in Africa. All of this he donated to the center. And I couldn't think of a better opportunity to recognize that contribution to the center uh, than tonight. So I'd like Bob to come forward and just say uh, a, a few words. Uh, and I'd like his wife, Margaret, to also stand. Let's give him a round of applause. Goodness. Thank you uh, very, very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, President Montero, Dr. Campbell, and Ambassador Sith, that was too long an introduction. It was, it was wonderful, and I appreciated it very much. Um, Provost Campbell, if it wasn't for the Evergreen program, which allowed me to attend the ambassador's course last fall, this donation probably never would have taken place. Uh, also, at our very young age, uh, Margaret and I can't think of a better place to make the donation. The other day I complained to the ambassador uh, that my wife, Margaret, suggested we give our last few pieces to the center, which we did today. Uh, and I said to him that we wouldn't have any old African relics left. His response was that Margaret would still have me. <laughs> I'm also reminded of a chairman of a certain bank, I can't name him here because I'd get into trouble, I worked for when he was asked by a friend if he was making any plans for his succession, and he said, don't you realize I'm immortal? <laughs> What's great about Evergreen, and I really want to emphasize this, is that senior citizens can audit both graduate and undergraduate courses, and there's a lot of intergenerational exchange, interplay, discussions. I've seen a few of my ex-classmates here from last fall, and I'm delighted to see them again. Um, and in addition to, to the um, ambassador's course, I took another course this spring with a Professor Elizabeth Prodromo on Turkey and the European Union. That was a graduate course only seven students, the average assignment 600 pages uh, a week. Not, and ambassador's assignments were almost as bad, but it was a great, it was a great challenge for me. And the reason um, um, uh, Margaret and I lived in Turkey from 86 to 91 is that we had grown tired, tired of all the problems, especially the development problems in Africa. Um, I wanted a break from the continent at the time. Uh, 
fortunately for me, I, I became reinvolved in Africa in the late 80s and 90s as a board member of the Nigerian bank, which I had set up, and with the responsibility for the ultimate sale of the bank, I also opened an office in Cape Town in the late 90s. Also, thanks to Professor Willard Johnson, I worked hard to gain the passage of the African Growth and Opportunities Act as a delegate to the African Summit in 2001, and that was a great experience. However, of even more importance to me, I guess at this old age, um, was your course. Um, I become, even at this age, less of a cynic and about the development problems of Africa. And uh, I'm delighted that President Montero is here. Um, and it's really wonderful now, in my opinion, to see that real progress is being made, certainly in the select group of African countries that we studied. Um, and, um, it also has made me recognize that we've made some real mistakes in the early days of development. Uh, when I was an agro-industrial development advisor to Nigeria, we were emphasizing import substitution, and I think we made some mistakes along those lines. But that was 50 years ago, and, and, and things have changed, thank God. Um, you've already mentioned, the ambassador's already mentioned our, our confrontation. He said, I was on the other side of the fence on apartheid. That's not quite true. I was, in, I was responsible for correspondent banking and trade financing in South Africa for Bank of Boston, and he persuaded us to stop everything. So I came over to his side, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, his pers pers persuasive powers were, were terrific. Um, I greatly appreciated being exposed to the African Presidential Archives and Research Center. It's a great concept uh, to have a residency program uh, for democratic elected ex-African leaders as our honored guest is today. Um, a great place for the study of, of democratization and, and free market reform in Africa. You know, I do come from the private sector. I'm a little biased. I sort of lean towards the free market side, but it's, it's wonderful to have this as a forum for it. Um, and the exposure for the BU students for this sort of thing, I think, is just great. The art collection is an eclectic one, put together over a 55-year period, ranges from Bambera headdresses in the form of antelopes from Mali, purchased in 1959, while we were in Liberia, to a Shona stone sculpture from Zimbabwe done by Fanazani Akuda, a very, quite a famous um, a sculptor to a Yoruba Eshu cult figure purchased when we were in Abadan, in Nigeria in 1962. The papers and studies the ambassadors already mentioned, uh, they can't be found on Amazon.com, they can't be found in any library. Uh, I think it'll be great material for professors and students, especially interested in economic, agricultural, industrial, and banking developments in Africa, and Nigeria in particular, throughout the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Thank you very much. The biography of our esteemed and distinguished lecturer is printed in the program. And since we are a society of literate men and women, I won't read it to you. I'll let you read it for yourself. But I do want to say a few words of introduction about President Montiero. We first met approximately four years ago. He was a participant in one of our African presidential roundtables, a gathering of his former colleagues and leaders from the public and private sector from around the world. The year that we met, the focal point of our discussion was the facilitation of private capital flows to the continent. One of the things that impressed me and inspired me to want to get to know this man better was that he was a clear and visionary thinker. He represented the best of his generation of leadership on the continent. 
we've been fortunate to have uh, preceding him leaders like Kenneth Kaunda and Ketumil Masiri, who represented a generation of leadership on the continent. For them, the struggle was how, as Africans, do we get our countries back? Following them, it was important to have another generation of leadership that understood a broader and more complex question. That being, now that the continent is free from Cairo to Cape Town and we have our countries back, how do we make them work? President. Antonio Monteiro is of that generation of leadership on the continent that, first of all, gets the question. And his tenure is distinguished by the efforts he made in Cape Verde to make it work. So for us, to make this offer was an easy decision. For the question for APARC was what better interpreter of current trends and developments than this man? Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to introduce as the fifth Belfer African president in residence, His Excellency Antonio Mascarenas Montiero. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank Ambassador Stis for his kind words. Let me acknowledge the leadership of this distinguished university, Provost David Campbell and President Robert Brown. Provost Campbell, I am honored to stand before an audience at a renewed university that has excelled in academia and has been directed by your leadership. I thank you for your welcome. In addition, I would like to recognize the former Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, Kerry Haley, and Cape Verde Consul General, Maria Jesus Mascarenhas, who are both in attendance this evening. University students and faculty friends, colleagues, leaders of today and of tomorrow, members of the Cape Verdean community, welcome. It is a pleasure to address you on this evening. I am pleased and honored to have been appointed as this year's Balfour African President in Residence at Boston University. I follow 
in the shoes of some Africa's most distinguished statesmen. His Excellency, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, Sir Ket Miller Mazire, to name two. I want to express my appreciation to Boston University and to the African Presidential Archives and Research Center for this opportunity. I also want to express my appreciation and commend Ambassador Charles Stith for his vision and work to create this forum for former African heads of state and engage Americans as well as learn more about America. I look forward to a productive term as this year's Balfour resident. I am long way from home, but the distance is eased by the fact that there are many Cape Verdean here. First and most important is my wife. In addition, Cape Verde has the distinction of having more of our, our countrymen in the greater New England area than in Cape Verde. <laughs> so, with the exception of Boston's very cold winter, I expect to feel very much at home. For my opening lecture, as the Balfour resident, I was given free, free reign to talk about what I wanted. I have chosen to focus my remarks on the subject, the obstacles of leadership and the perspective for the future. Let me start with an apology. English is not my mother tongue or the lingua franca of my country, but the love of Africa is our primary language. So, if you hear with our hearts, I am sure we will understand each other. Several epithets are used to commonly characterize the situation in Africa. It is often called a continent without hope, the continent of lost opportunities, the continent without a future, the continent, the marginalized continent, and so on. These exaggerated and abusive generalization are caricatures of the continent. But like all caricatures, they reflect a reality. The reality is that Africa does have its problems. The problems are significant enough that leadership in Africa is not an easy task. African leaders are facing tremendous challenges, which are proportional to the difficulties that our continent confronts. These challenges are in many forms and are of crisis proportion. Every day, millions of Africans face enormous difficulties, injustice, and other serious problems. Many families do not have 
the minimum means considered indispensable to a dignified life. Many children are condemned to live a life on society's margins due to the absence of a home, daily bread, and the love that only a household can provide. Many young people take refuge in drugs and delinquency, resulting in dissatisfaction, frustration, and a complete lack of a perspective of life. Life for many women is a nightmare of constant violation of their basic human rights, with them living as victims of physical and psychological abuse. Beyond the personal trials, and the tribulations that burden individuals in our countries, there are bigger geopolitical problems that beleaguer the continent. Two of, of the most prominent and deadly <coughs> are the conflicts in Darfur and Somalia. The Darfur conflict began in 2003 when rebels took up arms saying the region was being neglected by the government. According to the United Nations, 200,000 people have died and around 2.5 million people have been displaced. Unfortunately, the prospects for peace are uncertain. In Somalia, the conflict between Somalia's transitional government and the Somali Islamic Courts Council gained an international dimension with the intervention of Ethiopia supporting the government and Eritrea supporting the Islamist militia. The situation is chaotic and peace seems difficult to reach. Over and above the armed conflicts which persist, a great number of African countries are victims of another type of violence, AIDS the plague of modern times, which has already killed millions of men, women, and children. The rate of maternal and infant mortality <coughs> continues to be unacceptable, happening with the same incidence and prevalence of tuberculosis and malaria. While life expectancy is progressing on all other countries, in Africa it has been regressing over the last 20 years. If these problems were not enough, primary education for all is far from becoming a reality. The disparity in educational opportunities between the sexes in primary and secondary schools only adds to the problem. Having said this, it is necessary to recognize that some African countries have made considerable progress on the way to accomplishing some of the United Nations Millennium Goals. A few of them have done what was necessary to lay the necessary foundation to reach all of, all of, the, goal, of, all of the goals of the Millennium Challenge. 
disease Y, the shadowy situation I described earlier can't in any way lead us to become pessimistic. The difficulties we are facing today must be considered as a step that we can overcome soon. There will be a brighter day for Africa. It seems like only yesterday that the apartheid regime seemed firmly in place. So many people believed that black South Africans were condemned to be dominated forever or for a long time coming. But thanks to the struggle of black South Africans and the support of the international community, the apartheid regime is history and the Republic of South Africa is now an exemplary anti-racial democracy. In the same way, there was a time when nobody dared predict that the Angolan conflict would come to an end this soon. Today, Angola lives in peace, and the present challenge is consolidating its democracy and development. The armed conflicts in Liberia and Sierra Leone, because of their extreme cruelty, did not seem as if they would ever yield a durable pay peace. But fortunately, the weapons are silent in these two countries and they are moving painfully toward the process of national reconstruction. We can say the same concerning Rwanda. Despite the genocide, it has achieved a certain stability in its process of reconstruction. At this moment, as I speak, Côte d'Ivoire, which descended into the hell of violent armed confrontation, seems to have finally opted for peace. Significant steps have been made in the negotiations resulting in peace between the parties in conflict. The positive signs reflect a positive trend taking place on the continent. The trend is toward democracy and transparent governance. <coughs> democracy is a critical factor for development and peace. This is something we have come to fully appreciate in Cape Verde. It is why were able to make a smooth transition to multi-party democracy involving all the people with their various visions and opinions is not this way, but is the only way to ensure the peace and stability that further development. I am proud that my election helped lead the way in my country. As a continent, if we are going to put an end to the armed conflict, overcome illness, and vanquish under development, we must continue making efforts to establish and consolidate democracy. Democracy is not compatible with the law of the strongest, or violence is a resource. It requires the existence of a just, equitable state 
that promotes cohesion and a common purpose. A state that adopts transparent and rigorous rules of administration and management and a strict respect for human rights. Today, Africa has a number of states that practice good governance with free and transparent election, independent judiciaries, efficient and impartial administration, and a strict respect for human rights. The practice of democracy in Africa is not a miracle. It is the result of the good, the good judgment and the goodwill of African political leaders working with our people. We appreciate that the responsibility to develop our continent is in our hand. History does not register any case of an underdeveloped country that has overcome the barrier of underdevelopment relying on foreign intervention or foreign aid. In my opinion, foreign aid or assistance of any type only produces the desired results if inserted in an internal process where the people are committed to a sense of community and development. We have to collectively find forms to produce the internal capacities and the available resource to create new strategies for development. This view, this view reflects my sense of what development means. Development cannot be considered merely a question of numbers, measurable only by economic growth. It must have as the main objective social justice, good governance, and respect for human rights. It requires major investments not only in physical infrastructure, but also in human resources. It must inspire energetic action in the fields of health and education, the fight against poverty, as well as policies aimed at the promotion of equality between men and women giving flesh and bones to this type of vision requires a special kind of leader. Unfortunately, there were some African leaders not up to the challenge of the continent. We definitely have not had true reformers as leaders in far too many cases. Many eminent intellectuals and experts have been marginalized or persecuted in years past. The excess of the elites in power requires the compliant approval of the two sides in the context of the Cold War. But the tide is turning. Like Krem, more and more of good leaders are rising to the top. On the other hand, leadership failures outside the continent have also hurt Africa. The drastic measures imposed on African countries during the 80s by the Bretton, Bretton Woods institutions 
were devastating. The toxic formula of structural adjustments resulting in decreased public aid and foreign investment have had catastrophic consequences. Poverty increased exponentially, which provoked a climate of instability and social tension. tension. We can say that, in certain measure, it caused many armed conflicts. Fortunately, our continent is currently the object of much attention by new actors on the international scene, like China, India, Brazil, and South Africa, all of which means new opportunities for Africa. In particular, China's interest in Africa has grown exponentially. In the 60s and 70s, China established relations with Africa on an ideological basis, helping some countries it considered friends, as well as supporting liberation movements fighting against colonialism. In the 80s, Beijing starts to show interest in investment opportunities on the continent and promoting external trade. At that time, the China's economy was beginning to take flight. The interest of China in Africa reached new, new levels in 2000 with the first China-Africa Forum which assembled 44 heads of state and many businessmen. The second forum took place in Addis Ababa in 2003. During that meeting, 250 agreements were signed and the total volume of exchange doubled, increasing from 10 to 20 billion US dollars. Compacts reached 37 billion dollars by 2005. China is now the second largest importer, importer of African oil after the United States. 25% of its importation coming from Africa. In 2005, China replaced the United States as the primary client for Angolan oil, and it also built a refinery in Sudan. In November 2006, 48 African heads of state and government and 1,700 African businessmen participated in the China-Africa Summit in Beijing. Important decisions were made by the Chinese government, such as doubling aid to Africa by 2009 providing concessional credits to Africa, totaling 5 billion US dollars by 2009, canceling concessional credits to highly indebted low-income income countries, lifting tariffs on 440 goods from low-income countries, in some way, India, Brazil, and South Africa are investing heavily throughout Africa. For their third, the United States, the United States 
is making a big effort towards engaging Africa. The Bush administration created an excellent deve development program called the Millennium Challenge Account. This program was conceived to fight poverty around the world. It benefits a number of African states, with Cape Verde being one of the first African countries to benefit from this program. Cape Verde have received 110 million US dollars grant that will enable us to develop our agricultural sector, which will improve yields. It will also enable us to do infra inf infrastructure development on our transport and road system, which will enable us to get manufactured goods to the ports and boost the trade, as well as make Cape Verde a more attractive sit site for tourists. According to some observers, Africa has not started the 21st century in a bad way. This assertion is being confirmed by several facts. The African Competitiveness Report 2007, released on 13th of June by the World Economic Forum, the African Development Bank and the World Bank noted that, quote, after years of economic starvation, Africa is experiencing an economic resurgence. Between 2001 and 2006, growth in gross domestic product, GDP, on the continent averaged 4.9% annually. In 2006, the continent grew by an impressive 5.5 percent, and in 2007, this is expected to increase even for 6.2 percent, the highest growth registered for decades. It is obvious that the reduction of conflicts on the continent accounts for some of these positive changes. From the peak number of 16 conflicts in 2002, that number has decreased to six in 2007. One should also remember that the remaining conflicts, those in West Sahara, the Niger Delta, or the boundary skirmishes between Ethiopia and Eritrea are not as intense. So the number of deaths is small. The tide is turning. Hope is in the air. Africa has enough material and human resources to take the qualitative step that, or, that we all desire and need. It's true that the situation on our continent is not brilliant, but the challenge we have to face can be overcome. This is a hard task, no doubt about it but it's not impossible. The path to be trodden is long, but Africa can do it with success. 
especially if we continue to make efforts to establish and consolidate democracy. There is nothing like empowering and involving the people to encourage the achievement of peace and acceleration of the development process. In terms of natural resources, our continent is extremely rich. It, rares, it has appreciable levels of the world's reserves of critical minerals. We have 76% of the world's phosphate, 73% of the diamonds, 8% of magnesium, 20% of the iron and 54% of the gold. There are enormous natural deposits of ores to still be identified. Our continent supplies the international market with other ores, such as bauxite, chromium, Cobalt, platinum, titanium, uranium, and vanadium. There are many hydro hydrological basins with enormous hydric potential. In terms of human resources, besides the existing capacities on the continent, we can count among our arm the experts, the experts who left Africa in pursuit of better conditions of life and work. And we can also count the African diaspora that slavery spread across the world as a set. With so many things going for us, I think the African Renaissance that so many of our leaders see for Africa is possible. I believe that with your help and love, with us working together, African and Americans, we can ensure that Africa's time is now. Para os falantes de língua portuguesa, queria dizer que apesar das imensas dificuldades que o nosso continente enfrenta, África continua a progredir e é um continente do futuro. I told to the speaking uh, Portuguese people, that despite enormous difficulties, Africa is a continent on the move, making tangible progress. Thank you. Muito obrigado. The, uh, uh, you may be seated. President Monteiro, we have a few minutes left, uh, has agreed to uh, entertain uh, a couple of questions. He's bringing your microphone. Um, thank you for your uh, great words and thank you for visiting the other half of your country that lives here in the United States. Uh, we're all happy to see us. Um, will you call for free education from pre-kindergarten through the end of high school throughout our country as a step towards 
some of the progress that you've talked about. It continues to be the greatest challenge for children in our country that they have lack of access to education and lack of opportunity to learn to be part of this 21st century economy. Please, can you repeat your question? Sure. Free, Will you free, call free, free, free education? education for all the children in our country? For all the children. Mm -hmm. Whether they have parents or not, mm -hmm. whether they are orphans or not. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your question. I think uh, the government is doing a big effort to give the opportunity to give the access for all our children. And uh, I think the education is the main uh, sector for all Cavendish government since independence, you know. And if they don't do more, it's because it's not possible. I think free education for everybody is guaranteed in Cape Verde now. At the primary school, uh, I think it's 100%. In secondary school, a large a large percentage of, of, of children uh, uh, have uh, access to the, 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 the high school. For the university, for the university, the situation is different because the government don't have means to cover all necessities. More questions? Another question. Go here in the bottom. I just want to say thank you for your presentation. And he's bringing your microphone. Excellency, thank you for your presentation. Many African governments are spending more money on weaponry than on education and health. And massive amounts of money have been transferred from Africa to the developed world to buy guns. Would you advocate for preventing the sale and distribution of the amount of arms flowing into Africa? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I agree with you that uh, the purchase of weapon is not a good solution for Africa. Fortunately, in my country, we don't have this problem. And I think this trend is going back. Many countries in Africa is all about the de development, are all about the, the health, education, and so on. This trend is not, uh, is not uh, big as uh, uh, a few years ago, or a few decades ago. We have uh, many conflicts in Africa, but the, conflict, the conflicts are decreasing, and I think you are you're right when you condemn the purchase of weapon, because we don't need conflicts. We didn't, we, we Africa needs development needs good health, good education, and so on. Um, there are critics in this country um, about China and China's aid policies to um, Africa. Uh, the critics maintain, the critics maintain that it really is an exploitation of raw material, control of raw material. 
How do you answer these critics? Because China aid is, is uh, very significant now and contributing in a huge way to the development of many African countries. Yes, uh, I think uh, China is doing in Africa what Africa needs, investment. Uh, I give some uh, statistics. And uh, the last report of the uh, IMF said that uh, the growth of Africa in the last years results of these investments. It's true that uh, Chinese are not in Africa for uh, philanthropic reasons. <laughs> they want earn money, you know, that's true. And Africa needs uh, the, this investment. I think it is an opportunity, a new opportunity for Africa. And sometimes people uh, condemn China, saying that China is trying to recolonize Africa. I don't agree, because uh, the colonizer arrived in Africa, and uh, they imposed their rule by force, by violence, with weapons. And China, China's presence in Africa is through the investments. The situations are very, very, very different. Sometimes uh, people said that China supports some dictatorship like Sudan or Zimbabwe. But I can tell you that uh, China is helping democratic countries like Cape Verde and others, Senegal, Mali, and so on. Uh, contra on the contrary, of a widely, a widely accepted opinion, the presence, the Chinese presence in Africa is not recent. You know, this presence uh, starts as I, I told you, in the 60s, helping the, some uh, socialist and non-aligned countries, helping the movement of liberation, fighting against colonialism, and so on. And the exploitation of raw materials, it is a good thing, because it is a competition, you know, between China and other uh, countries uh, which need uh, raw, material, raw materials. For instance, in Niger, Niger sell uranium to France. The uranium, uh, a few years ago, cost about uh, $10 a pound. Now, because the Chinese presence, the Niger uh, uranium is $150 a pound. You know, I think <laughs> the, the Chinese presence in Africa is an opportunity, <laughs> a good, a very good opportunity. Thank you for your question. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Your Excellency, the former president of uh, Cape Verde. Yeah. Um, on reflecting in Africa with uh, your presentation tonight shows one significant thing, which is very generic in the whole of the continent. Generic, something which is general among the African leaders. Now, would you 
consider our problems in Africa as African problem, or some portion can be, can you apportion some of the problems to the advanced countries, such as United States and most of the European countries, or is it the African leader's problem? Thank you. Yes, but I didn't understand the last part of your question. Uh, you asked me if the, our problem in Africa are African problems, or? Yeah, what I'm, what, what I'm trying to, uh, the question that I'm trying to pose is that, can you, is it possible to apportion some of the problems to the advanced countries? Or is it the African leaders' problem? For instance, you know, stealing most of the money and then banking it in the advanced countries. The, the, the African leaders? Yes. That, uh, a moment, please. No, you, you know it. Uh, it depends on the on the on, on the country, because I think our problems in Cape Verde are not the problems of the 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 the, the, the develop, developed countries. We have our problem, our specific problems. I I, I understand uh, your question because. Some leaders in Africa are problems for their own countries, like uh, Zimbabwe, for instance, or like uh, Bashir in Sudan. I agree with you in this aspect. But for the rest, we have uh, our social problems, our economic problems, but there are our own problems. You know, I don't know if I, <laughs> I could uh, answer your question. Perhaps you can, uh, you can mention uh, corruption and, 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 and other phenomenons, phenomenon that uh, exist in Africa, but uh, Sometimes some leaders are problems, not the solution, but problem for their own country. Yes, that's true. We've got uh, the, the hour grows late, uh, and I hate to do this, but I'm compelled to do it at some point, and that point is close to now. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do. One other question, Mr. Yes. President? Yes, okay. yes, okay. One other question. Um, good evening, Your Excellency. Um, my name is Liz, and I'm a very, very proud Cape Verdean um, young person. And I have a specific question about business development and leadership. You mentioned earlier in your speech there are more um, Cabo Verdeanos in the world than there are in the islands of Cape Verde. That, to me, presents a very unique opportunity. Um, Recently, my grandfather passed away after 30 years in America, in Cape Verde. And my entire family had to go through the monopoly of travel to pay $1,500 a ticket each to go to Cape Verde, yes. to be astonished that still after 30 years, that most of the businesses on all the islands are owned by Italians, Germans, and now the Chinese. Um, and so my question is really about, I'm a successful business person. You know, I've been afforded a very good education. What is Cape Verde doing to foster leadership here to sort of bridge the gap so we can own our own businesses in our country? And I think that's a really unique opportunity because I know plenty of Cape Verdean doctors, lawyers, business people, college professors. So I think there's a gap missing there of us fostering our own leadership. Is that question clear? Mm. <laughs> 
It's more about yeah. how does Cape Verde take that but opportunity that there are a lot of Cape Verdean leadership do, do here. You want, uh, something? Do you want to do something in Cape Verde? You I think have, a lot of people. have an initiative for Cape Verde? I think a lot of people have heart and initiative for Cape Verde and find it difficult to get cut through the red tape of helping our own country, um, whether we're in colleges you know, or as business people. You know, uh, we have a consulate in, in, in Boston, you know. I think uh, it's better for you to, to consult the consulate to discuss uh, with the consul the, this issue, you know, because uh, I am a former president, <laughs> I, <laughs> and uh, my my last uh, my last mandate finished in 2001, you know. Main legislation uh, uh, were adopted in the in the country, and. Uh, I think uh, we have some problems with uh, with uh, investors, uh, capital investors, some difficulties. But the government is trying to move to remove these difficulties and to create a climate uh, more uh, adequate for investors and uh, for uh, our our people living in abroad. I think. Uh, if you have uh, a specific questions, you can uh, put them to the, 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 the consulate. It is. Th th let me just say, this was a perfect question for closure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, let me, and let me tell you why. <clears throat> the problem that uh, she articulated is not unique to Cape Verde. Uh, well. And in the last two, presidential roundtables that we've had, one of the points of discussion has been how Africans in the diaspora can be engaged to assist with the development of Africa. One of the things we're hopeful of taking advantage of while President Madero is here, and we need to get your card and anybody else interested in participating in this kind of conversation, is to begin to think through this question in a strategic way so as to begin to give to leadership on the continent a roadmap for making it happen and for enabling folks in the diaspora to appreciate that there are opportunities here and that's how they can be accessed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's give President Montero another round of applause. <laughs> look forward to an exciting year, engaging him on a myriad of questions, uh, many of which he touched upon in his address. Um, I would simply conclude by, uh, first of all, thanking the APARC staff and uh, volunteers. Uh, we have, uh, fortunately, uh, I think about 15 interns, Boston University students who are affiliated with APARC, who are working this evening, and I want all of them to raise their hands, take a bow, stand up, raise your hands, take a bow, and let's give these students and my staff uh, a rousing uh, round of applause. The other thing that I'd like to bring to your attention before we close, uh, we have been, uh, since the spring, attempting to organize a series of forums for the, the present crop of presidential candidates, both Republicans and Democrats, to address the general theme of Africa and U.S. security interest. Uh, the, first, the first forum in this series will be held on October the 15th and uh, Republican candidate uh, United States Senator Sam Brownback will be uh, the first up. So uh, check your email, look for the announcement and we hope to see you back. Thank you, be careful, God bless you and get on out of here before the Red Sox let out.